So without more ado, I'd like to hand over now to Father Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Although the West has appeared to become increasingly secular, a closer look reveals a good deal of religious sentiment that is not expressed through traditional institutional channels. This sentiment comes out in a variety of ways, as a desire for transcendence, or perhaps a re-enchantment of the world, a concern for authenticity and integrity, a sense of connectedness with the earth, or a coming together in times of catastrophe and shared civic tragedy. Collectively, this has come to be known as spirituality. Now for those who follow the practices of historical Christian traditions, spirituality has meant a disciplined set of values and practices that follow a specific path toward holiness and faithful discipleship, laid out by trustworthy guides and years of lived experience. <clears throat> One can thus speak of Benedictine spirituality, Franciscan spirituality, Jesuit spirituality, Carmelite spirituality, Dominican spirituality, and the like. In contemporary secular discourse, however, spirituality has come to have a more diffuse meaning. It may refer to diverse practices and feelings that individuals, drawing upon a wide variety of resources, put together for themselves. Such spirituality is often self-guided and self-regulated, very different from what most religious traditions require, namely a handing over of one's autonomy to a trusted guide who has already trod the pathways the inexperienced person wants to travel. Those schooled in spiritual traditions are often put off by what seems to be casual and unreflected borrowings that rupture the integrity of those spiritual pathways. This is especially the case when elements of Christian spiritual traditions are mixed with elements from other religious traditions, as well as esoteric and even anti-religious and anti-Christian sources. Moreover, the idea that this can all be self-directed flies in the face of virtually all religious traditions who speak of the need to work with an experienced guide into these mysteries. Behind all of this kind of spirituality, there is also often a mistrust of institutions. Some of this mistrust arises when custodians of religious institutions act in ways contrary to the professed teaching of those same institutions. Sexual abuse scandals of recent years have made some individuals suspicious of Catholic claims. Extravagant displays of wealth or the hankering after power by religious leaders turn others away. In other instances, the mistrust arises out of claims that all institutions are always corrupt. Now this is an assertion one hears in secularized societies that are in fact very stable where institutions provide a security that one can take for granted, something not available in many societies where, for example, the judiciary or the police forces are not to be trusted. In yet other situations, religious institutions are seen as one of the social services of the state, which can be called upon as needed. This is something that British sociologist Grace Davey, already a number of years ago, called vicarious religion. This was in evidence, for example, when a memorial service for the victims of the Atoya massacre in Norway in 2011 was held at the Lutheran Cathedral in Oslo and not at Labor Party headquarters, for the Norwegian Labor Party had sponsored the gathering on Atoya Island. In another instance, a church service was held in Amersfoort in the Netherlands in 2014 for the victims of the Malaysia Airlines flight that had been shot down over Ukraine. In both instances, highly secularized societies chose to hold their memorials to the dead on church property rather than in a secular civic arena. The Oslo instance is especially interesting because there were people at the Oslo service, the service was actually a Holy Communion service, an ordinary Holy Communion service, who did not want to go inside the cathedral but wanted to be on church property for the service. Mistrust of institutions leads to such well-known expressions as, I am spiritual but not religious, which often means, I have spiritual yearnings but I do not want to submit them to institutionalized patterns. Such thinking goes hand in hand with a proposed cultural ideal 
that each individual's life is a project of self-construction, assembled out of a series of choices that can be done or undone along the way. Charles Taylor's work has helped us rethink secularity and the religious response to it. He has reminded us of how many values secularity and Christian faith share. Indeed, secularity could not have taken the shape it has historically without Christianity behind it. He has helped us see that what is being called spirituality holds many impulses that also find a home in Christian faith. <coughs> These impulses can be perverted by larger social forces, of course. Most evident at the present time is the attraction of extremist groups like the Islamic State or Boko Haram for young men and women seeking to be part of something larger than themselves. The motives of these would-be jihadists are complex, but among the elements that spur them on into these groups is the dissatisfaction with the quality of their lives in Europe or North America, as well as the reach for transcendence embodied in fighting for a cause. There is an element of quest for those heading to the Middle East and other places where extremists are showing themselves. What I want to suggest here is the glimmerings of transcendence or breakthroughs into the buffered self can serve as a platform for the church to meet those with spiritual hungers they are trying to satisfy. What I have detected in places that have been marked by acute secularity, such as Norway or the Netherlands already mentioned, or in less secularized nations, such as my own country, the United States, is that the youngest generation now coming of age, <coughs> that among that generation, there is a manifest desire to touch the transcendent. This desire is framed by a strong individualist mindset, often one distrustful of institutions. Yet the yearning is there. It is at this point that the church needs to begin. It is not the platform that perhaps leaders in the church would want to have as its point of departure, but we have to meet people where they are as a way of beginning. For those of us within the church, it will require a certain kind of self-emptying or kenosis. I do not mean here a forsaking of our integrity, but rather a self-emptying that will exhibit the self-integrity of our own humanity, with all our own desires for the transcendent to become manifest among us and around us. Upon that platform of a shared human quest, a forum for encounter can be built that allows for a more sympathetic understanding of these undertakings and in turn be seen as a site for more focused and constructive critique of those spiritual efforts upon the part of secular people. Pope Francis has spoken of the mystica of encounter. It gets translated mystique in English. But mystica is an untranslatable Spanish word that speaks of a whole world that certain actions can create. And encounter is a word that creates its own mystica, I believe. It summons up meeting people where they are rather than having them come into the church before they can be spoken to. It means attending to all the complex, confusing, and sometimes contradictory words, feelings, and gestures that are displayed. It listens, too, to the silences and the stammering that bespeak yearnings of great power that may be what St. Paul and Romans called a groaning beyond words. Here, the example of the encounter of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus with the risen Christ gives us a clue. Jesus enters into their conversation as a listener and only speaks after he has heard the two disciples out. Only when they have concluded their narrative does he dare to take it up, to tell it, in a new way. <clears throat> Pope Francis urges religious orders, for example, in his letter for the year of consecrated life, to engage in this mystica of encounter. He has embodied this mode of encounter in his own behavior by going to what he has called the, I quote, existential peripheries of our societies, to those who are poor and who are marginalized. Now the first reaction of many to climbing onto such a platform and engaging in such an encounter is that one cannot accept just everything. One must remain critical. And this is indeed true. But what Pope Francis is calling us to, I believe, is to understand that encounter means that we do not begin with critique, 
but rather we must first gain trust. Gaining trust allows those whom we encounter to feel safe enough to share their aspirations as well as their doubts and fears with us. Critique comes later as a constructive affirmation of their struggle toward transcendence that helps them move a bit further down the road. Typically, we are too quick to engage in critique. That urge to jump in and counter assertions that are being made may say something about our own insecurity. Pope Francis' own manner of suspending judgment until such bonds of trust are established provides a good model of how to proceed. Engaging in such a practice of encounter, however, brings with it another possibility. The spiritual traditions that have arisen in, within Christianity in the course of the centuries came about in specific cultural circumstances that not only shaped their beginnings, but also caused them to engage distinctive concerns and issues as they developed. Think of how the trauma of war shaped the founders of such distinctive spiritual traditions as those of the Franciscans, the Carmelites, and the Jesuits. As the church engages secular and post-secular societies, looking for those points of engagement may expand existing spiritual traditions in significant ways. Let me give a few examples of this. One point of encounter has been the use of silence and contemplative prayer. I've seen young adults attracted to Eucharistic adoration, for example, for very different reasons from the earlier practices of the, that that devotion had intended. For those older practitioners, Eucharistic adoration was an act of resistance to Protestant rhetoric about the real presence of Christ in the sacrament. But for the young adults practicing Eucharistic devotion today, it is the atmosphere of silence in a media-soaked world that attracts them. I've also seen Eucharistic adoration practiced in poor and violent neighborhoods in my own country as an antidote to gunfire and senseless violence. Likewise, monasteries, both in North America and here in Europe, have opened their doors to weekend guests who wish to partake in the silence and the rhythm of prayer as a respite to the everyday lives filled with restlessness and competition. Another side of encounter are the short-term so-called mission projects that expose young people from wealthy parts of the world to the poverty and injustice that the poor and much of the rest of the world face on a daily basis. Such projects awaken in those who go on them not only motivation to bring about justice and an end to oppression, but also make them aware of the resilience that allows people to maintain their humanity in such dehumanizing conditions. They see what life is like when basic social institutions fail to provide security or are absent altogether. They learn too what a, relation, what a relation of dependence upon the transcendent can mean, not just a sacrifice of their own autonomy, but also a discovery of deeper sources of support and strength when all things around them seem to falter and fail. Thus, rather than seeing the constructed spiritualities of individual seekers in secular society as misguided, we may be able to see in their journeys gateways into exploring common themes of our humanity. These can indicate genuine spiritual hungers that speak of both these things that are deficient in our post-secular post societies, despite all the promises of globalization, as well as offer opportunities to introduce seekers to the rich spiritual traditions of Christianity in new and creative ways. A certain self-emptying on our part <clears throat> may lead to a dialogue with seekers that has the potential to enrich their lives, even as it purifies our own. Thank you.